Hi, I'm Britt Ransom. Hi, I'm Kimberly Thomas. I just didn't really know what we were going to have in common in a lot of ways, but um, having faith in the Geeks team, after listening to everything, I was like, oh my God, we're so similar in a lot of different ways. There was too much. There was so many things that we just had, um, you know, scale, um, emergence. There was just so many different themes that we had in common in our work. I guess, in more mechanical ways of building and constructing works, there was a lot of um, commonalities and, oh, trees. I, like, I, you know, like you like, I like trees for different reasons, but we just had, like, there was objects or sources that we were drawing from um, that, you know, maybe in a different, we got different things from them, but we still had that, um, that connection. As a sculptor, glass is maybe a material that's the least familiar to me, at least in terms of my like own skill set. But it was really interesting to kind of like look at the way you also are kind of using this material to like, we're both building these kind of like speculative worlds or kind of dipping in and out of things that are very human and kind of uh, moving into a space that's more kind of dreamlike or starts to pose a lot of questions. And I was really interested in the way that like you are like hyper specific and so detailed in glass. I think scale was certainly one element of it, but I also was like really interested in your ability to kind of take that as a material and both like mimic things in in the real world or things that we recognize like teeth and like our bodies and like kind of aspects of humanness. Um, and those aspects of humanness that are maybe sometimes kind of gross or like sometimes that we think about as being like hyper personal, both like kind of making them in this, this kind of microscopic scale to a certain extent, but like talking about these kind of like much bigger world kind of sensibilities and moving in and out of these kind of multiple worlds that we like live within. I think when you were talking about going on walks, definitely it was like interesting to me that like we both use this as a mechanism to, I feel like I think about walks as like an expansion of a studio. Um, I feel like a lot of times people are like, what are you up to in your studio? And a lot of times that answer for me is like, I'm not in my studio <laughs> in, in in its sense of its four mm-hmm. walls. I'm in my studio in the sense yeah. of like, I'm being fed from this environment that mm-hmm. I I like need to kind of like, take, pick apart and reconstruct. And I I saw that happening a lot in your work um, and in your practice. And I think impression wise, yeah, at first I was kind of like, this is such an interesting material that I feel like it feels very foreign to me as of right now. But I felt like the further I looked at it and kind of broke it down into the ways that we use different materials to like reapproach ideas and processes that we all experience in the world or maybe are trying to escape or fix. Um, I felt like, you know, there was a lot of alignment in our practice um, and our practices in that kind of sense. Britt, you mentioned that 3D modeling doesn't necessarily want to scan or copy something as fragile and complex as the work you produce. Why is pushing the limit of 3D printing and other computer-aided tools an important part of your practice? A lot of the reasons I'm like really interested in these tools and these processes is that, one, they're starting to become kind of more um, regular aspects of our like day-to-day lives. I know that like, you know, you can use your cell phone now, for example, as a 3D scanner. We're kind of using apps and systems that like use AI and, you know, AR and VR in our spaces, like these augmented and virtual systems that we're kind of constantly living within and kind of living with now. And I think we don't we don't always kind of sit and think about the reality of that. I'm really interested in kind of using 3D modeling and 3D 3D scanning in particular, I would say, to try and capture elements from our world because I'm I I think I'm a little scared and a little apprehensive of accepting the kind of truths of these systems sometimes. Um, And I'm interested in the scanner's inability oftentimes to copy really intricate things in nature that I think of as like an absolute, right? We can see it, we can feel it, we can touch it, we can experience it. 
And like, what does it mean when we put that back into a computer system and then try and put that back out into the world? I'm really interested in the ways that like the computer, um, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, they're building their own intelligence based on what we put in. But at the same time, there's still this kind of data loss from, for example, translating an environment from physical space into computational space and back out. And I'm kind of interested in that like slippage in between of like, the fact that like we want so desperately to like sometimes capture our environment, save our environment, maybe pick up a rock from a place and put it in our pocket, like keep a piece of ephemera from a site. Um, and I think the computer, obviously we're getting way better at like systems that are able to do this. I find that both magical, scary, and also a little bit sad that like, I'm really curious about what that kind of like data loss in translating from one space out to another kind of means. Um, and I think that's, you know, kind of the real ethos of some of my practice with the scanner is like this, this ability to trust, but also this like kind of sadness or like a mourning and losing certain aspects of maybe our landscape or a tangibility of a place I can maybe only visit once. Um, and having to like find a way to hold on to that or this very human desire to collect that in some kind of way. Um, and so, yeah, I think about, you know, the computer's inability to often like perfectly replicate that, but yet our kind of constant human desire to keep making tools and engaging with tools that get us closer to that. And I think as the world around us changes, that kind of like copying or duplicating or layering might become more important as we like start losing certain aspects, certainly of like nature or environment or certain landscapes or those landscapes change. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's why I'm so interested in it as like a complex and fragile system. But um, I think about it really as this tool that might be our only way of kind of like, fossil making or record keeping. It's kind of like, you know, it's like when the, when photography was invented for the first time, this is a new form of photography in a lot of ways. Um, and I think about what that means and how we capture and kind of replicate our environment and also share that in the future. Yeah. So aside from like record keeping and like historical type of, I don't know, um, categorizing and things like that, do you feel that it's, you know, as a human experiencing the world as it changes, like the idea of attachment and the, um, like the changing world is like how, imp like, cause everything changes and like living in the past is a thing, um, you know, but in order to move forward, like things have to change. So do you feel like um, at some point maybe like, like your idea about keeping things or being attached to things would 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 change for you too or do you um like is it necessary it's like okay this tree is like it was you know a root and it grew into this but the future um may be more wonderful than mm -hmm. like what mm -hmm. is now you know in a way mm -hmm. like does that have any like resonance with you and your yeah that's such a good that's such a good question and I'm like oh you've caught a little bit of my like misanthrope <laughs> interior um in that like yeah that's such a good question I mean I certainly don't think about these tools as things that like maybe make something extend like forever or like um like in a lot of ways and I think about this, the work that I made, like with certain trees, it's like in a lot of ways, these things aren't meant to last forever and forever and ever. They have a lifespan. Um, and I do think about our kind of like human desire to like over, over protect or over save or over preserve certain things. I mean, there's obviously a lot of historical and sites and preservation that like, I mean, I, I desperately like want to keep, but I think um, that's such a good question about thinking about like, you know, kind of freeze framing something or this kind of like desire to hold it in this kind of moment. Um, I've never really thought about like my kind of feeling about it on the other, on the other end of like that, like what this other side of this might be. Um, I think I'm kind of, I think about these tools and these processes in ways, usually always responding to something that like 
we know is like slipping and we want to keep it. But I think at the same time, I've never really thought about this kind of way of thinking about it in the, in the speculative sense of like, but what if it's better beyond us keeping it? Yeah. Um, that's a great, a great question. And now something I feel like I'll think about a lot. Yeah. Um, didn't really answer your question. It's, but. It's, it was just like a thing to think about. Cause I kind of think about that. I think in my work or in, you know, just in terms of like being attached or having, um, you know, what things don't ever stay the way, like the same, you know, like that's the only constant is change. And so in some ways I'm kind of like, yeah, I want this thing. I want to hold on to this mm -hmm. thing. And some things like, you know, are very necessary that we need to think about our past in order to move forward. And then other times I'm like, well, what if like I'm holding on to this thing, but the next, if I let go, like this other thing will be better. Or if I, I change the way I, I think, or I change this one thing, like about a project that I had this idea and I was stuck to it. And then when I released that idea, I was able to move forward and like make the thing better or I was able to solve the problem and so you know like thinking about like our work and everything like how like you know this transition like we're like our, a lot of our work is about transitions and things like that and so things are always going to change and constantly like become new and that is I guess maybe like you know things that we work on in our lives as humans but also like in our, our practices so you know, just something that kind of like sparked in my mind when I like when you were um, talking. So, Kim, you discussed how you mix your own colors and you frequently push the boundaries of what glass can do, whether that's incorporating mixed materials like metal or making sculptures with moving parts while making the fantastical inventions featured in your work. What is the importance of invention and fabrication in your practice and how do they relate to each other? I feel like it's something that just naturally happens. First of all, glass isn't always the best material to make some of the things that I'm making. And I think that's probably one of the driving forces where it's like, well, I'm going to make you the best material <laughs> for this, or I'm going to make this thing work. Um, like we were talking about the future just now, there's so many things that we haven't really discovered or that I haven't, just maybe other people have, but um, you're constantly learning and like figuring out ways to make your practice better, um, more efficient, um, you know, getting to like, just always trying to like get to that next level. The things that I want to do, I think I have to, I have to push this material. Um, and just see what it can do. And then I like to experiment a lot. So, or I was like, oh, I want this texture. I want this thing. And that's where some of these other, um, you know, innovative techniques have, um, have come from is just trying stuff. And then sometimes like by accident also that happens, which I think is like really fascinating and like really fun. And you're like, oh, wow. Like I just did this thing. And it's like, it's beautiful. I didn't mean to do that. It was totally an accident. You know, like that's always like very exciting to me. So um, I feel like I'm just naturally inquisitive and I want to discover and I want to just go where these things can take me. And so pushing, kind of pushing anything to the limit too is like myself, you know, <laughs> my work, but like everything I just want to kind of want to just, I think that's just like naturally my, um, my personality. Well, I make these uh, cloud writing contraptions and then like uh, other type of inventions. And that's just like, par like part of like being a human, I think, is to come up with ways to make your life work or to figure out how to be a human in a lot of ways. Like that's how humans got this far was inventing <laughs> stuff and like making ways to do things um, better or more efficiently or um, to make your life more comfortable. And then um, I guess the storytelling part of my practice is a lot about invention and fabrication and um, 
so that kind of comes together and okay, I, I have this storyline um, in a way are these like uh, these stories that I want to tell. And so that's, I mean, I don't even know if I'm inventing them. I think that maybe they already, they exist somewhere in this other plane and then I'm interpreting them maybe in more, I guess is like more um, accurate description of what's really going on. And um, I think that's how everything sort of blends together. It's just, uh, you know, I want to make these things and I want um, to tell these stories. And part of that is inventing ways to make um, those ideas uh, relatable to the people that are going to see them. I haven't had the opportunity to buy a continuous melt furnace, but I figured <laughs> that I might ask someone who has had the pleasure of working with wet dog glass. And so I thought I would ask you, Helen. So outside of my role as the director of Geeks, I'm the head of the glass lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I first got here in 2013, and one of the very first things I sought out was to upgrade our furnace. I immediately got on wet dog's radar. Eddie and his team came up and installed our 700 pound continuous melt electric furnace. Our furnace has really been the workhorse of our studio for roughly the past decade and it's still totally mint and it's it's kind of phenomenal to realize that all the hot work that's come out of the UW Glass Lab over roughly the past decade has come from this furnace. The shop dog access and being able to look into the furnace remotely has really just alleviated, you know, a, a lot of concerns and granted a lot of peace of mind. I always tell people like, oh, God, having a furnace is like having a baby. <laughs> but being able to see into what is going on at the furnace from afar has been like just a super crucial and useful tool and has also enabled a lot of delegation in terms of working with technicians and tech support and not having not having to feel like it's all on my shoulders. They had also, <laughs> they had made a stop motion video of their install and like snuck in a frame <laughs> with like a sign that said, hi, Helen, or something like that. I gotta, I gotta look that up because it's been a while. Their team was just so fun um, and so swift and competent in terms of just like rolling in here, having three days to assemble this like giant ass piece of complicated equipment, but it was really seamless and super fun to work with them. Wet Dog Glass is your studio's best friend. Learn more at wdg-us.com. Thinking about a line from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, the world is full of painful stories. Sometimes it seems as though there aren't any other kind. And yet I find myself thinking about how beautiful that glint of water was through the trees. So is science fiction or speculative fiction an important resource for you and your work? What authors or books have been important to you? Do you feel that dystopian readings of your work are accurate or are they missing something more complex? I didn't know there was a name for um, what I was doing. <laughs> I mean, I never thought about that in a way until I spoke with them. Um, uh, Samantha Dottilio and she was like she called it speculative futures and I was like oh my god like what are you talking about so you know when I was saying that we just do things um, naturally that um, and that that's like you know you're just like doing the thing that you do so it's just coming out in this way and like not really like analyzing it I think in the same like from an outside perspective I was like just doing what I wanted to do and that was more my focus was like okay um you have this thing that you want to do and if you're going to do it then you're just gonna have to like let it flow and let that like let yourself be weird let it be like completely unusual um do things that maybe you've never seen before and that that was my focus uh that point, um, I hadn't thought about like, oh, this is kind of like science fiction or this is speculative future or anything. It was just making stuff um, and just like being like, I'm a storyteller and an inventor. And that's what I am. That's what I do. And that's what I'm going to call myself. It's 
really important. I guess. And you know what? Um, and maybe in some ways, I don't know if this is, if the things are from the future, you know, or if it's like, it's not fiction either. I think that they're real <laughs> and I think that they exist in another dimension. And I guess for this uh, 3D uh, earthly dimension, that these things would be considered fiction or imaginary. Um, but you know what? Like Leonardo da Vinci, he made flying machines. Like, <laughs> it's like they, I don't know if they would really work. I mean, I maybe they do in an other dimension. Like, that's the thing. You know, like my nephew was saying, well, there's only one problem with this is that a cloud can't suspend um, these. Like, I was just like, you know what? Um, a plane flies, it's all made of metal. So, like, why can't mine? You know? And it's like the science might be different for it. I don't, you know, it's just, I haven't worked that part out. These are just like the things that I'm making. And I think that that's what I like. And then again, like Octavia Butler, I, I haven't, I ordered a book, but I haven't read it yet. And like it keeps on coming up. So I feel like right after this, I'm going to start reading um, a bunch of Octavia Butler. Do you feel that dystopian readings of your work are accurate? Wait, am I reading this right? Do you feel that dystopian readings of your work are accurate or are they missing something more complex? I think maybe it is missing something um, because I feel like that's, like we're living in like dystopia right now. Like it's, you know, like this is the beginning of the end or it's like the the middle beginning of the end <laughs> in a lot of ways. Like look at like, look what's going on. Like look how the world is. Like people can't afford to, like live in, you know, I feel like maybe it's always been this way, but it's becoming, people are awakening more to what's going on. Some people aren't, but some people are, you know, and um, like, this is, we're, we're living it. This is, you know, maybe this whole thing was supposed to always be sort of dystopian and there's always this destruction and this um, uh, cycle that we're moving through as, you know, as humans. And so, um, you know, like, uh, what Octavia Butler is saying, you know, there's still, we still find joy in living in this way, but this is kind of just what we're used to. So, you know, you, um, it's true. There is like this dystopian, like that, my work does talk about that a lot and everything. And um, I feel like that's an important part of it, but there's maybe a, a balance in a way or um, a brighter future, but it's not in this, on this world. It's like in a different dimension or it's a different place. And maybe that is like here on earth, but you know, maybe not like maybe we'll get through it. Um, and find, I don't know, that portal. But at the same time, um, I don't know where I'm going with that. But, <laughs> um, you know, like, it's true. It's like, that's what my work is about. It's like, um, I guess, saving your yourself from uh, the, the destruction or rebuilding, I guess, or re like emerging. It's interesting. The last part, it's like, but I find myself thinking about how beautiful that glint of water was through the trees. Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of ways, when I think about like going on walks or I think about these kind of moments of inspiration for the studio in contrast to the kind of way that we're existing in the world as it is right now, I think a lot about that. It's like if we lose sight of that like moment of beauty, it sounds so cheesy to say it, but like if we lose sight of being able to kind of reframe ourselves and look at the world through that lens, I think it's hard to kind of address or think through or work through a dystopia. Um, I think you have to kind of like recognize these moments of like when we are given something or we're, you know, able to experience something that maybe takes us out of that dystopia for just a minute. Like, I both like want to hold on to it and also like use it as a way to be like, but look and like use that moment as a way to kind of like reframe, but like look at what we're also doing kind of to ourselves or to each other. Um, 
And I think about that a lot. I I think like a lot of times, like for me, my studio practice is taking that glint of water and reframing it for us to think about. And I think you're doing that too in a lot of ways of like, you know, talking about this like, but speculative kind of what ifs, like what if we existed in this world with this flying machine? What if I could take it and ride somewhere else in this? Um, I think it's interesting how we're both kind of doing that. I think Someone asked me recently, like, if I'm really into science fiction and I always think to myself inside, I'm like, no, like, (laughs) I don't like, it's so funny. I like don't watch science fiction movies. I don't read science fiction books, but it is a common kind of like theme or like a perception in my work. And I'm, I'm starting to pay attention to it a little bit more. Um, I think in the sense that it's been a like genre that I've largely kind of rejected for no reason, um, other than like, it's just not been something I've thought I've been drawn to, but I think actually I am. Um, I think about the movie, like maybe not so much in books, but in movies like Metropolis, the like 19, like, what is it? 20, it's like 27 movie, um, of like thinking about this kind of world. I think about that certainly in the way that like we exist now as this kind of large human machine. Um, I also think about, there was this book that came out and this isn't maybe science fiction, but I feel like it, it, it moves in and out of kind of like these science fiction um, suggestions. It was called Frankenstein's cat. And it was about, um, cyborgs that are here and that we live with now. I think the author's Emily Anthes. Um, and like, it's about how now we kind of even exist in this world, both as cyborgs and with cyborgs. And like, I think about that a lot in terms of like the phone being this kind of like cyborgian weird attachment to my body, even though it's not quite literally attached, but I can't seem to like detach, but I am. Yeah. And like, I think about, you know, just all of us kind of all of these like augmented things for pets, even like things to like feed them or be engaged with them when you're away. Like there's all of these kind of like new robotic systems and mapping our faces, and our bodies and all of these things that are definitely like science fiction. And I think speculative, new. Um, and I do find that like in a lot of ways, like, yeah, part of our like new dystopia and a lot of ways I'm like, Oh, but there's like really interesting ways that those things could be used too. Um, like, have you seen the movie, the fifth element? Okay. So like in that movie that like, I think about this a lot, that like cockroach that goes across the desk, it has like a backpack on it. Um, And like now it's like they use that same kind of model for like search and rescue in like earthquakes. Um, And, you know, so like in the same way, I'm like, oh, there's all of these ways that I think about like insects or bodies or like how these like technologies meet bodies or kind of meet themselves in physical objects. And um, yeah, I think about that both as dystopian, complicated, um, and at the same time, like, it's a, there's elements of it that are exciting and like useful. Um, but I do, it's interesting that like this question of science fiction for both of us is like, yeah, I, I may be projecting, but like two non-science fiction per se fans, yeah. or, like, kind of people that like <laughs> read that often. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how we've like kind of tapped into like different yeah. elements mm-hmm. of that. You know, somebody would say, oh, like, this is, I'm going to do a science fiction thing. And, like, you would be, and I was like, you think this is science fiction? Like, that's so Uh weird that you would say Uh that because I've never thought of anything that I did as science fiction. But then, you know, when I think about it, I was like, oh, robots. Like, robots are kind of like, and then um, I didn't, you know, I was like, I really liked the movie Terminator from when I was a kid. And then The Bionic Man. And, um, you know, just like, you know, more um, current movies uh, with, uh, you know, robots and, you know, the mixture of humans and robots. Oh, and Alien when, um, you know, she like uh, Sigourney Weaver gets into that uh, big like robot thing and is like fighting the aliens and stuff. And it was just like, I, I guess in a way I didn't realize how much those um, things from like my childhood had um, influenced some stuff and I mean I guess even like making like you know making flying machines is 
you know, and using like cloud technology <laughs> to make them fly. But there's like a very, I mean, for my work, there's very like manual way. It's like in my real life, um, I like, you know, like the toaster that just pops up, not like the dial thing or, you know, just like things that are, you know, like rotary telephone is like pretty easy to use, you know, <laughs> like those are, that's how I feel in my head. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, no, like these things do, like we would not be able to do this right now if we weren't on the, com you know, the computer, you know, together. And so there's this like huge influence, I guess, of science fiction that maybe I was never, um, you know, like really, um, like hadn't like really seen for myself and then like after it was brought up to me I was like oh that's like you're right because I feel the same way about science. like I like it but I'm not like ooh science fiction like let's yeah. do yeah. science fiction today or you know whatever people who like science fiction say um but <laughs> you know it's like I, it's nice it's like it's pretty good yeah, but I wasn't I wouldn't have you know and I've read like a few like science fiction books as like, you know, like a kid and stuff like that, but were novels, things like that. But I was never like, oh, let's like really delve into a lot of science fiction stuff. But, you know, I guess there is like this kind of like deep or, you know, uh, correlation between our work and, and science fiction. And I mean, I guess so, because like you're emerging from a, a bug Kirkus, in a way, so it's like pretty science fiction -y mm. Yeah, there, Brit. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. So, but when I see it, I don't like think, oh, science fiction. I think like, oh, Brit's emerging from this bug, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> in a very yeah. natural kind of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess. I mean, I just maybe I just see it as like science. And like, that's totally possible that you can do that. <laughs> like, I believe it. I think my work is often commenting on our kind of like current dystopia. So like, I feel that that kind of reading is to a certain extent accurate. Um, and then in other ways, I'm also kind of trying to like more so point to how we often are looking at systems that surround us and think about them as kind of like, gross or unnatural or things that like we don't like you know think enough something like an insect system um and it's interesting to me that we kind of project this idea of like a grossness or even like maybe a dystopian like attitude towards something that already kind of exists with us and i think yeah that the in in some work like that kind of attitude of reading something as a comment on our current dystopia is accurate in a lot of ways and especially in earlier work, I was kind of trying to use like a, a little bit of like a dark humor to kind of point to the fact that like, we're kind of no different than this other world that we think is so gross. And in a lot of ways we operate the same. And in a lot of other ways, if we looked at it and spent five minutes learning from it, we maybe would operate a little bit differently, um, maybe more efficiently, maybe, um, you know, kind of wouldn't be adding on layers to the kind of dystopia that we're living in. So I, I think that that's an accurate read in, in some of like, especially my earlier work with my, with um, like thinking about like insect systems as a, a metaphor for the way that we kind of operate um, or don't operate sometimes. So can I just ask you about grossness? And uh -huh. so, um, like you being like literally like gross, like yeah, we're gross. Like I'm uh -huh. gross yeah. right now. So yeah. uh, that's another thing that we really do have in common about our work because I would make, um, you know, like certain pipes I would make back in the pipe making days. It'd be like, um, you know, there, there were vaginas, like tongues, mouths, and I wanted. Uh, to make things that if it was actual, like in not made of glass, like actual like real, that you wouldn't put your mouth on it. But it, like it's a pipe, it's, it's glass. So technically it's like relatively clean, depending. Um, you can put your mouth on it. And then I think about like, um, you know, how, how gross humans are. And like, 
so like with the vagina pipes, it was just like, um, you know how like the, like the feminine like body is considered disgusting, but at the same time, like so desirable and so beautiful. And, you know, people were so offended by this vagina. And I was like, but, you know, you have a wife. Are you offended by her vagina? <laughs> like how how horrible of you to say that about your wife, you know, like about vaginas in general, um, you know, and, but then sometimes I'm kind of like, like there's like certain aspects of things that there can be like just this, I guess a dichotomy of like the, the total op, like, you know, humans are pretty disgusting. Like we're, we're absolutely hideous and just filthy in so many ways and then um or you know how like pigs they're considered like the filth like the filthy animal but you know like I don't really eat a lot of pork but it's very delicious like it's so good um you know so like there's just like the differences between like why something is disgusting but at the same time why is it so like wonderful I mean I don't like bugs I was talking about a, a caterpillar the other day that I had to suck up with the vacuum but like they're not <laughs> disgusting. Like I don't know why I'm afraid of it. It's like yeah. you know, like they're they're nice. They're good. They're good for the mm. earth. They're good for the trees. Mm. I guess they're good for a lot of things. But at the same time, I'm like ah, it is, and like suck it with a <laughs> vacuum. And yeah. so like your whole idea of grossness, you know, like how, like why, what is your, you know, that's just I think it's interesting. You know, that you yeah. think about, like, the grossness of of humans and their existence. Mm -hmm. And then can mm -hmm. you just, like, talk a little bit mm -hmm. more about that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, and also, like, I'm a part of this system. I think sometimes when I say that, everyone's like, oh, I'm a fit. You think I'm gross. I'm like, I am also, too, a part of this kind of yeah. larger system. Mm -hmm. I think about that, like, not, I think about that, like, certainly about us kind of, like, collectively, mm -hmm. right? Like. Mm -hmm. Um, this kind of like collective bohemian system that's kind of like crash coursing through the world, trying things and then realizing later like, oh, we created a system and we actually messed up this other one. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I, I'm really like that part of like humanness mm -hmm. is like so interesting to me. And I think so it's so fascinating to me that we kind of attribute that kind of this idea of grossness to these other systems. And mm -hmm. I think we do that. And again, like I'm not a I'm not a scientist or like a philosopher, but I think we do that because they're systems that are unfamiliar. They're bodies, quite literally, like bodies that are unfamiliar, that are nothing like ours. And so it's it's interesting this idea of like grossness um, of the system. And I often like kind of think about things in reverse. Like if I could ask a colony of ants, like what they think about me, it's probably not that I'm like a good system or I'm part of a bigger thing. I'm probably part of this like terrifying kind of unit that like comes and rearranges the earth or steps on them or like, you know, I think the idea of grossness to me um, and it's certainly within my work has kind of been this space of like, I think being honest with like how I think I operate in the world. And I think trying to approach the rest of other systems that are non-human in a sense of like, instead of like approaching them as a gross thing, thinking about the ways that like our collective grossness can kind of like inform one another. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely, like I think about insects a lot and like kind of a collective aversion that most people have to them. And like, I'm definitely not averse to it. Like there's certain insects that like I definitely don't like or like I'm afraid of, like I don't like scorpions or like a, so like, you know, they have a way of moving and doing things. It's so unfamiliar to me. Um, and like that, I think in a sense is like, whoa, I don't understand your body mechanics. And I, I think that's like what a lot of ways, like with these kind of insects or systems, I don't understand your mechanics. So that's weird. And like, I think that's a, that's a kind of like place that I land a lot with like, thinking about this idea of like collective grossness or collective systems, um, certainly in like materials and, um, you know, I'm making a lot of, in a lot of ways that are like totally the antithesis of a lot of what my work is talking about. It's like the complete opposite of a process. Um, 
but yeah, I, I think grossness and like that word gross or like, you know, this idea of like squishing something or, you know, I always ask, it's like, are you a, like a squisher, a like person that puts it under the cup mm-hmm. or are you the person that ignores it? It's mm-hmm. like, are you the squisher, the swatter or like the remover? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think about that, like a, about myself, like w- what's my agency in my system? Like what kind of like gross do I like level of gross do I kind of operate in within this larger system? But um, it's so interesting. I think when you kind of strip back this idea of like ignore the insect or whatever it is for it's like ways that it's different from us. It's like there is a certain kind of level in which we all land. I think it's like, yeah, we're all kind of these systems that are figuring it out. Um, I think some have figured it out more efficiently than others. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's another thing because I see like in your work that um, you might not understand this uh, object or this thing, but you take um, initiative and like you have the desire to learn about it, which I think is a lot um, which is different than like maybe most people in the world who are like, ah, oh, it's gross. Like, let's kill it, you know, like just get rid of it or never think of, you know, like the ignore or like, the squisher type of situation. But like that, I feel like in order to, you know, it's like you have to learn about something in order to understand it. And, you know, in order to create that knowledge is, um, you know, it's like goes past like the, you know, okay, that level of grossness that, you know, to make, in order to make things not gross, I will try to understand it. Or in order to make things like not um, uh, unfamiliar to me, I'm going to investigate. And so that was one thing that I was really interested in, in your work too. Um, you know, cause like, I kind of feel that way, you know, in my work too, where I'm like, oh, there are these unknown things and, um, you know, they may seem uh, frightening or scary or you know like the different facets of like human nature like how we have to kind of understand ourselves in order to be able to transcend in a lot of ways and you know it's like in this way like these uh, insects are disgusting and it's a whole nother world that we're not really used to and it's like tiny and microscopic and then in my work I see like you know this uh you know the world that we can't see um uh you know in order to understand like we're kind of like doing like uh like this uh deep dive into like different worlds and understanding um you know like the like not so shiny aspects of like our existence so i thought that was very interesting too welcome back to the his glass works cold shop We often get a question of, what's the best process for my glass? Where should I start? What's the best grit to start with? What's the best progression to take from a rough grind to a final polish? Now, the faster diamond discs go, the more efficient they are. They'll grind things faster and they'll work faster. If you're not used to a diamond disc yet, you may want to slow it down a little. So let's give this a try. Now that worked down pretty quickly. As a start, this is great. It didn't take long. It flattened out the surface nicely. Working with his glassworks means working with experienced and knowledgeable glass artists. Their team has well over three decades of cold working experience. If you want to learn more about how to use and maintain cold working equipment, hisglassworks.com is an incredible resource. Check out their support section and browse their video library for even more guidance. His Glassworks understands that your work leaves, but your tools live with you. Learn more at hisglassworks.com. You both mentioned going on thought walks, which made me think about how your practices balance research, intuition, and observation. What do you learn from thought walks? How does what happens outside of the studio influence your studio practice? Yeah, those those thought walks, I feel like in a lot of ways are the are my studio practice. Like I know the making aspect is obviously like where the work gets produced and happens. But like for me, without those walks, I'm not engaging with the worlds I'm then making work about. So like those are often the basis of like discovery for a system that I want to pick apart. 
So like the bark beetle um, pieces that I had been working on, for example, I was aware of them as a pest, but the reason I got so interested in them was that I was on a hike in Kings Canyon and found like a chunk of trees that all were impacted by the same thing. And like the scale of that, the confrontation with my own body with that, um, picking up something and not understanding a system and being totally mystified by that. Like, that's just one example of like, I need those kind of touch points outside of like the walls of my studio to like bring in that kind of thought process and picking apart to reconstruct work. Um, so like that outside of the studio for me, a lot of times is the studio. I often like kind of complain that if I've actually spent too many days inside of the studio, like I'm not approaching my work the right way. Um, I feel like for me, I let sometimes like those moments in nature kind of guide what the next project will be. And then I'll spend like years kind of, you know, um, picking that apart or learning it. Cause I'm not, I'm not a trained scientist. I am someone that is like really interested by these systems, but doesn't always understand them. And I think like for me, those walks are like the inquisitive, like starting point. And I, I guess like in a lot of ways, I want my work to like take people on that walk with me sometimes. Like um, I hope that like my work kind of situates you f like from a point of like, I went on this walk and this is what I found. And like now I've spent kind of this time resituating what I found for you on that walk in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, those walks are so important. I mean, obviously for the other reasons of like being outside and like clearing one's head and kind of like, you know, leaving that dystopia for a minute that we were just talking about, I think is important. But um, yeah, the walks are like, they are my studio practice in a lot of ways. They are the starting point. I get like I've always like really liked just going, you know, for a walk, but um, I think it was like kind of just, uh, I don't know, I wanted exercise and I wanted to uh, like be able to think. And then I was starting to kind of study these ways to um, like accelerate my brain waves and have epiphanies and be able to think um, more deeply, just like develop cognizance you know mm -hmm. and one of the ways to do that I thought was to go for walks so I think I talked about it a little bit earlier was that you think really hard about something and then you just don't think about it or you do something mundane like wash dishes take a shower or go for a walk like the uh, outside of the studio type of um, practice was very important for me um, at the same time because I would um, like the sky is very important and like being able to see the sky and look at the clouds and um, observe, you know, what the clouds are doing and how um, sometimes there's no clouds and sometimes there's lots of clouds and all of the different kinds of clouds and things like that. And then, um, you know, looking at trees, looking at the grass, looking at people's lawns, looking at things that are on the ground, um, you know, and then um, observing, you know, even like not just walking, but driving and like seeing all the trash that falls off of cars or like remnants of, you know, things that are left behind, um, you know, on the sidewalks. Like after I was in Detroit, there was a flood. Um, all of downtown area flooded and then like the garbage that people put out after their basements had been destroyed or their homes had been um, flooded just like people what what people leave behind and um, what is out in the world or just trash that's left or just, you know like um, an accident that had happened um, there's my favorite street in Detroit was called Mac Ave is called Mac Avenue and um, I was driving home one night in a car had uh, driven into a building and it was just, you know, things that are uh, left behind, you know, in a lot of ways, which is actually one of the titles of um, a, a, a triptych I made. Uh, so like being able to observe all of those things and that's why going on walks um, was so important to me is not only to think about things and clear my mind and get messages and get information or receive information, um, it was a way to um, observe what was going on in the world. 
Um, like there's a big difference between like driving and walking is because, you know, you're driving, you're like, Ooh, you know, look at that thing. And, but you can't really look at it. Like, you know, when you're with, with a person in the car, you're like, okay, you describe the accident to me while I keep my eyes on the road. Like that's, you know, like you can't fully experience that. But when you're walking, you know, I would have like a favorite tree and it was this like juniper tree and it had these really big berries on it. And I wanted to like climb the tree and like scoop all of the berries out of it. And then I would look on the ground to see um, how many berries had fallen. It was on somebody's property and um, I didn't want to get shot. So I would never go onto it, but I would stand there and look at it and admire it. And then trees that were closer to the sidewalk, I would pick their juniper berries and like rub, like like squeeze them and rub the juniper smell all over me. So it's, um, you know, there's just very tactile and very um, real and you can experience the world better when you're in it than when you're uh watching it or you know outside of it and um you know I feel like that's something that we lose sometimes as artists we're in the studio and we're like I have to make this thing and I become very uh focused you know like this uh like pinpoint focus but there's like this whole world going on outside and like you have to go out there and experience it. And if you, um, if you go on a walk, you know, you can, you can, you can see those things and you can feel them and experience them and observe, um, firsthand, but at the same time, like, you know, you choose your distance. Um, so yeah, walks are, you know, they cover everything, like the research, the intuition, observation, like you can experience everything just in a walk. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite? This is a just a, like a personal question for me. Like, do you mm-hmm. have a favorite time of day that you like to walk or that you like to um, like, do you have like a duration or a time mm-hmm. or like a moment that you like, like to go do that? Um, when I'm in my routine, it's kind of uh, like between 10 a.m. and 11, I guess, like uh-huh. that kind of yeah. time where like people are out and doing stuff. But you know what? I love walking. Sometimes I'm scared to do this. Like more in a city, I guess. I like walking at night, like when it's really dark. That's so interesting. Yeah. yeah. I told someone the other day, and they seemed horrified that I was like, oh, some of my favorite times to go walk is like midnight. And they were like, you go outside at midnight? And I was like, like yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like I had a moment that I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess – as a woman and in a city, like often not the the easiest or smartest thing to do. But at the same time, I'm really interested in that kind of quietness, um, a certain amount of stillness at sunset. It's sunset for me, though. And so it was interesting when you're like 10, 11. I'm like, I like almost crave it at sunset time. There's something about that, like changeover of like daytime to nighttime guard of like animals, insects, people were all doing this kind of like rotational thing. Um, and I'm just like, like mystified by that, like moment of that changeover and like being able to visually see it. So I was curious if you had moments too, that were like, you know, like felt right to Um, you. I like walking like kind of any time really though. It's like, but the, I feel like it's location that um, makes the biggest difference for me. You know, um, I like walking in the woods like during the day because I'm afraid of being eaten by an animal at night. And um, but in the city, um, yeah, it's like definitely nighttime walking. And I, I like the, like, dangerous aspect of walking in the city alone as a woman. <laughs> and I, at the same time, I don't, because I've definitely witnessed some things that I didn't really want to see. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, I was just, like, I want to, or in, like, a, a suburban neighborhood, too. Is, and then, like, I like to look in people's windows also, <laughs> which is probably, <laughs> like, I just, you know, like, you can see. It's, like, an observation thing. It's not, like, a creepy thing. Maybe a little bit. Well, it's but, like a set. yes exactly so um you know and that's why I always I I don't have curtains up right now because I don't have the little hanging things but 
I'm a curtains person because I know how I am. And I'm like, oh, what are they doing in there? Like type of situation. But it's like, I'm just, I'm curious, you know, and I want to see what's going on. And then, you know, you get to a certain area um, of the city where there's like not that many lights. And then, you know, you can like listen for stuff or like, you know, like, what am I going to see? Or like, what's lurking? Or like a little raccoon, like jumping out of a, a garbage can. Like, it's all, like, it's like, sen- the senses are so stimulated by, um, like, walking at, like, a, a certain time. Like, even, like, in, I guess, in the woods, too, where, you know, you hear something and you're just like, oh, like, did you hear that? You know, like those, I like those moments where you're like, did you hear, like, I can hear something. Or I can, I, you know, I, saw, I thought I saw something because, um, you know, those are like, that's, it's just like really fun to like, it's, I mean, it's like pretty mundane, I guess, in a lot of ways just to like go for a walk. But I feel like it's a really like big form of entertainment, you know, like there's just a lot can happen. A lot can happen mm-hmm. on a walk. And, yeah, know. definitely. So what do you consider to be the difference between kind of seeing and listening? Mm. Like, how does that relate to the genesis of making your work? Seeing and listening are like really big, big deals uh, to me. You know, it's like not just from the observation uh, standpoint and um, a, uh, you know, like a earthly um, like way of looking at it, but from uh, like a a spiritual and ethereal way of like seeing and listening, and like I guess in um, a lot of ways of hearing uh, the spirit. I'm gonna say, for lack of a better um, way of expressing that, but um, I feel like a lot of my ideas. Like, not that they're not mine, but ideas kind of exist in this other dimension, okay? And if you open yourself up, um, you can funnel them or channel them um, uh, into your into your brain. And then, like I was saying before, we translate these ideas into, um, you know, our interpretation. Like, we interpret these ideas and make them... Um, uh, uh, I don't even like know how to even explain it in a lot of ways but you take these ideas and make them so that people um, can understand them and so that is a lot of how my practice works and is like I have these ideas but I have to translate them into a way of um, being able to share them with the world so um as an example, uh, the cloud writing contraptions, I, you know, they're a mechanism or a vehicle to escape, um, I guess, an earthly realm or just the desires or, um, I don't know, these like facets of human nature that are not really, um, you know, that wonderful, I guess, some things that we experience, even like, even like the wonderful things, because I feel like the other side or Um, other dimensions are just completely different and like more livable in a way as humans. But I started making these cloud writing contraptions and then um, for some reason I kept on running into the number 12, 12. And I guess sometimes in a, like, I'm just like, why do I like read this deeply into things? Like, is it really necessary? Anyway, it was because I went down this rabbit hole investigating the numbers 12, 12, and it relates to the Merkaba, which is the light body. You know, like you have this um, aura, it's not an aura, it's a, it's a light body. And with this part of your spirit, you can travel to different dimensions and to um, other timelines you can travel through time and like that's your spirit and it's not just like going um to uh, another dimension it's like really traveling through time and like really traveling to different dimensions and that's how i saw 
um, these uh, cloud writing contraptions. So, um, you know, like that's my interpretation of this Merkava was um, transforming this um, kind of ethereal uh, existence or your light body, these like spiritual um, ideas that nobody can actually see. Like you, some people can see them. Like, you know, some people can, like you can see auras, you can feel like a person's light body or their spiritual um, vibrations. And um, in order to make these ideas um, very accessible to humans and to people so that they can understand them, I translated it, it into um, a flying machine where you can travel to other dimensions and through time and through portals and things like that. And that's like, sounds very science fiction-y. And that's why I say, like, I don't see it as fiction. I think it's real because it is real. And I've definitely um, experienced it in uh, other ways. Uh, obviously, I don't think we have even enough time to talk about it today. But, um, you know, like being able to travel to, uh, to different worlds, um, it sounds like, like it's not real. Like it's uh, fiction, mm -hmm. but it is very very possible and you can do that if um you know you are attuned to it if you want to you know so that's how i see seeing and listening it's not just like observation of this like real world that we're living in um it's also an observation of the the spirit world or just this other um non-physical uh dimension that humans are a part of that's so interesting. I, mm -hmm. I like thought about this as like a question in a, it's interesting. Like I thought about it in a really literal sense of like seeing and listening. And it's interesting to hear you talk about it in this kind of space that goes beyond what we are like quite literally seeing and feeling and experiencing right now, right in this moment, something that's like tangible. I think for me, I was thinking about kind of seeing and listening. And I had a moment of like thinking about that as a question of like the difference between the two. And while I definitely understand the quite like literal, like physical differences of how we see and listen, I also think about them as being like reflexive of each other or even almost the same. Um, like to me, there are two things that kind of, at least in my practice and in my work, like I think it's like obvious to say, but they operate together. And for me, like listening, like deeply listening, going to an environment and shutting everything off and quite literally just hearing it or touching it or looking at it. But like in terms of like listening to it, I feel like that's the moment where like in a spiritual sense, I'm unlocked into another world. It's a world that I don't know. And this is the first kind of moment of me immersing myself in it. And trying to kind of pick it apart and understand it. Who's there? Like, that's the question that I'm always asking myself. I'm listening to something and I'm like, who is that? What is that? Why is that? Um, and I think the same thing in terms of like seeing, like picking something up that's like not a part of my world or my studio or my home and looking at it and being like, who made this? What, how did this end up here? Like, what is this? Why did something eat this or break it or um, those kind of moments for me are like, I think those are like the kind of like Genesis moments for me in my, in my practice. But like, um, I often use sound as like an agent in my installations to kind of like try and take you back to that place that I was, um, or like maybe experiencing, like maybe I had an experience that was like otherworldly and can I transport you there through like the way I listen to that environment? Is that possible? Um, and like, I'm not someone who thinks about, I don't consider myself a sound by artist by any stretch, but I do love the presence of sound in combination with kind of like, um, how I've picked apart an environment and trying to kind of, I'm not trying to recreate that environment for someone else, but I want them to maybe just have the same entry point that I did into that space. So that maybe when they visit a different environment, instead of like our normal kind of human way of trying to consume everything that they might maybe for a minute put on blinders and like listen to it first, then see it next, then put those things together. Um, but yeah, it's, in, it's interesting to, to think about, especially this idea of like traveling to another world in a, in a spiritual sense. I feel like we both do that in our practice. Um, 
or at least like hold those kind of moments in a, like a really high and kind of special regard in our practice, that kind of like emotional travel and, and metaphysical travel somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was the thing. Cause I was like, uh, I noticed about your work. It was like, we we're both trying to like transport people into, um, another environment. And then for one of your works, um, I guess the termites, you wanted everybody to get down and like the, so I do that in my work too, when we were like hanging or, you know, just like with the miniatures and like having all of these like things going on. I want you, uh, the viewer to um, like be close to it, you know, like don't touch uh -huh. it, don't uh -huh. touch it at all. It's very fragile, <laughs> but I want you to, uh, like you said, like the same entry point. It's where, um, you know, you can focus uh, and like the portal, like go through that portal so that you can, you know, your experience in that world can be completely different. Your entry point is the same and your experience can be whatever your experience is it, it can, is, um, but um, there is a certain way I want you to be, to see um, the work. And then, uh, you know, just like I was saying, all the senses are all um, uh, uh, stimulated. And so that's what, another thing that I liked about your work was the sound, light, um, you know, the visual part of it. Um, and I was thinking about how the senses um, are stimulated in both of our works. Like I don't have sound um, or even light with your work, um, but there is, those are things that I do want to incorporate and smell because I also make incense and I wanted to like make, um, you know, things that had smoke, or things that, um, you know, I wanted to incorporate light also um, for lightning and things like that. And so I, I really liked how you um, had incorporated a lot of the different senses. And I feel like um, as humans, like we lose, uh, you know, because we're like focused on watching our computer or watching TV or, you know, like we, we use the senses, but I don't think they're like being um, used to their full capacity. Um, so there's now there's dogs running by <laughs> like I don't know what's That's going true. on here yeah. um but uh there's like these like you know like using the senses in a way um but like concentrated you know what I mean and like really like highly focused so that and like maybe using more than one at the same time because I feel like um you know with glass you have to use your senses like your constantly watching focusing but uh, like you know you have to hear stuff and then um I guess you know like well in ceramics there was always like if you uh smell like reduction you knew your kiln like you had to like pump that oxygen up and I mean there's like reduction in um oxidation in glass as well um but you have to just like kind of like use your intuition and use your senses and it kind of goes beyond just like the yeah, like seeing, smelling, touch, you know, those like our human senses and it like goes past into like a more intuitive, um, you know, Claire audience and Claire, you know, like understanding what's going on because with glass and because with like some of these materials that we're using, things are happening. Like you can't see them. And I say like call it intuitive science where it's like, I know that's something I don't quite know exactly. And I can't see that it's happening, but I know all of these molecules are moving and uh, doing stuff and like heat and, you know, like it's, it's changing. Everything is changing. And like, you know, you're using um, computer, like, you know, you can't like physically see, like you can physically see what's happening, but it's like happening inside the computer, I guess. And like, I, like, I don't, I don't understand like how that happens. So like, to me, that's like kind of intuitive. Like maybe it's like more scientific in a lot of ways, but um, you know, like it, it just involves the senses and like knowing that things are happening without actually like seeing them, but, you know, understanding um, those things. So um, that was another thing that I really um, enjoyed about your talk and how you connected the senses um, uh, to like the, the end product of 
um, of your work. And it's just like very um, multifaceted and multidimensional. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. I think in a lot of ways, you said something earlier about how we are all kind of like, we're using our senses all the time, but I think what we're both doing is like asking people to tune them more often. Like, I think we're like asking people to kind of like either tune things out or tune back in, in a way that's like, um, whether that's through like quite literally like listening or seeing or scale or like, you know, kind of confusing scale in ways that like makes you retune how you look at space or how you listen to a space or you realize I haven't been listening to the space I'm in for a long time, you know, or at all. I actually haven't thought about that. I think we're both, I think what's really interesting about both of our practices is that like, yeah, I think we're asking people to like recalibrate or tune those, those like forms of seeing and listening in different ways. Absolutely. Okay, Britt, are you ready for this? Okay. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a question. (laughs) 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 How has storytelling and autobiography entered into your recent work and can you talk about new and current directions in your studio practice? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I feel like for the first like decade plus in my work, I definitely haven't been making necessarily work from a place that's like autobiographical. Um, maybe a certain amount of storytelling, but like not in the sense that I'm starting to kind of move now. So now, I think, you know, I started working on a project with my family. Um, I'm from Ohio and we started, I talked about this in my lecture that we started um, working on renovating like a national historic landmark that used to belong to my great, great grandparents. Um, And it's a significant like civil rights and activist site in a place that I think we often like kind of don't associate with that movement or even that like time period. This is like pre fifties and sixties kind of work. Um, and so when I agreed to start working on this project with my family, I realized like, I mean, not that I didn't think about it, but like the real seriousness of like reinventing a space, both in a place that I don't live all the time. And also for a community that like, I, again, don't live in all the time. So like, I've been thinking about, um, you know, that, that history and like what that means for me in terms of like that being a part of my history and like thinking about that autobiographically. And so my work has shifted to a place right now of kind of while we're in the middle of like renovating this really large site, like how do I then like kind of still tell the story without the site being there to necessarily kind of activate the story. So I've been turning in recent work to kind of using my sculptural practice and um, material sensibilities to like take elements of that site and bring them places with me, not dissimilar from the ways I've been working with like nature or bugs or trees. Um, and at first I was like, whoa, this is like very different from the way I've been working. But in reality, a lot of it has been still about like sensibilities of site. What is it? In, what's important about this site that I'm trying to communicate to you? What story am I trying to tell about this site? I think in this case, it's a little bit more literal. It's historical. It, it is autobiographical. I think my other work's been more about like speculative storytelling about a site or a system. Um, but now it's kind of definitely entered into like a more kind of factual historical restorytelling. Um, And that's been an interesting kind of jump in my practice. I'll be honest, like it's been a little bit uncomfortable only because I'm in a, I've been in a way of working that speculative has kind of been the main focus. And now I'm moving in a way where like accuracy is actually like a really key aspect of making work in my practice now. So like, yeah, I'm responding to a site still by like using scanners and photographs and technology to kind of recreate elements of it. But I'm now kind of moving away, at least for this specific body of work, I'm moving away from things that are less speculative and things that are more like historically true and accurate. Um, So yeah, that's been like a new direction and kind of a current space that I'm like entangled with in my studio practice. It's both exciting And similarly, like frustrating when you're trying something new and like working in a new way for the first time. Um, But feels also, you know, feels a little scary to be vulnerable about your own story, like um, and your own family stories. So there's some interesting aspects of it, but that's kind of where I am in my work. Um, But I'm curious, like how storytelling and like 
um, autobiographical, like ways of thinking and making kind of are, are working in your practice right mm-hmm. now? Well, yeah, that was um, when you were talking about the vulnerability. Um, I experienced that also because a lot of, um, you know, my storytelling, like I talked about the Markava just now and like these weird, like deep dives into uh, numbers or like personal experiences. Um, uh, you know, I just basically talk about that in my work, but kind of, um, in some ways remove myself. Um, but I was just at first, like when I was saying, like, I was just doing what was coming naturally and I had to allow myself to be weird and let things um, unfold as they were going to. And that is difficult to do when it's, um, you know, highly personal, highly autobiographical and like telling these stories of this, like this journey of um, awakening I, I, or transitioning or becoming like aware of certain aspects of myself. I mean, that I knew were there, but I didn't, um, you know, like I, I would never talk about them to anybody because like I said, I don't want to sound like a total crazy person. And then I came to terms with, I'm just going to sound how I sound. And if I do sound like a crazy person, then you're not my people. So, you know, like that was like that vulnerability that you were just talking about, like like definitely something that I have um, felt. And um, also with accuracy. And it's like, I know that this, like a lot of the things that I talk about in my work are not um, like you can't, there's no way to like really be accurate. I guess in a way because they're like channeled the messages from the universe or another dimension. Um, so, but my accuracy in uh, translating them and making them real for um, the viewer is um, a big thing. And so, I mean, I feel like my work is uh, autobiographical in a lot of ways, but um it's also just about um, like human nature. And so like translating that accuracy as well. And like maybe not everybody feels this way or not everybody is that way, but that is an aspect of human nature that I am um, trying to explain and that I'm interested in. Um, so like just, it's just like a huge part. And then, um, I guess like moving forward with my work, um, I wanted to work larger and not always with glass and maybe um, remove glass completely from some projects. But I'm I'm in love with glass. Like I could never ever leave glass. Like we are married. We are together for the rest of our. I hope so. Like we'll never say never. But um, I adore so many different things about glass and I just want to learn and do as much as I can with it so I feel like glass will always be a part but um I love other stuff too like you know we have this like we're not exclusive but we're really in love you know like we really love each other but we have like a freedom like we're allowing each other to just like do and explore everything that we need to in our lives so um I'm definitely going to try to work in the hot shop and then I just want to make a large scale model. I, I see the ones in glass as models of um, an actual thing. So I'm going to start making other inventions and other uh, flying contraptions, but um, big so that I could actually ride them. (laughs) So moving forward, and then I don't know, I like to leave space for just like everything um, Mm -hmm. moving forward. So that's my direction. And I like just started this residency. So I feel like the world is my oyster. And there's like, there's like a bunch of different pearls in there, not just one. It's like an oyster filled with, and like different colored pearls too, like pink ones yellow and everything so um I'm just I really I feel like it's just important to leave space for just who knows what could happen you know 
Um, and it's always like really important and just because of like, you know, the nature, I guess, like both of our works, like basically anything you could go literally in any direction and it'd still be like totally normal. And it would just be like, yeah, Ritz totally doing this like thing. And it's weird. And uh, that would be like completely normal, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I yeah. feel like me, uh, the same, like, you know, on that same spectrum as like, I'm just going to leave that space to do um, whatever's, whatever's coming, like whatever, like my brain or whatever message gets translated. And, you know, I just want to like, make sure that I can, I can do that and fulfill um, that, I guess, need or that fill that void. Hey, producer Emily here. As we were wrapping up, I asked Britt, have you been thinking about glass and glass practices differently after participating in Geeks Talks? And do you have any interest in working with glass in the near future? This is what she had to say. Well, I'm here in Pittsburgh. And so that's been a real like shift and just like learning, like literally like the history of material in this city, as we all know, is so interesting and so integral to like the way things like, especially like manufactured things. I think about like glass bottles and steel and like I'm in this like new place of like, you know, there's a rich material history here and, um, Certainly in like ways, very literal ways, like in looking at like, for example, reconstructing a historic site, I've been looking at like the way the glass, like it has stained glass windows, like the way that has changed or like thinking about these like ways of like, can we rebuild those or like, and I I mean, I know I can't, like, I know it's possible, but I'm like, but you know, in what ways and with what technology now? I'm like, I'm kind of interested in like these ways that maybe some of the ways I use technology and the way that glass functions could kind of meet in the future. Um, mm. I'm now working with students here that like I have a student right now that just did a, a residency at Pittsburgh Glass Center that like radically changed her practice. Mm. I mean, there's a person making installation work and video work who then took projection mapping and glass and put those things together in a way that like, and steel welding that I've never seen before. Wow. And so I feel like I'm being like exposed to glass now in a way that um, hasn't always been present. And I think that has a lot to do with where I'm living now. And like, I'm really interested in it as a material that like, it's a f- kind of forever fluid material. I'm interested in that like impermanence of it and the same aspects of like a lot of these like digital processes that I'm using things like in a lot of ways, like, also not having a certain permanence or permeability. I'm like interested in the spaces where those things could meet. Um, So I haven't started with it yet, but I'm getting very curious. Um, And I'm starting to see it intertwine in ways that like, I just not really thought about it before. Um, And I think that's really exciting. Well, I love Pittsburgh Glass Center. I did a residency there and I feel like it changed everything about my uh, perception and everything and had really sparked all of these. I mean, it's just like a combination of like the people and the atmosphere that, you know, that I was around. So yeah, I feel like hang out at Pittsburgh glass center. You'll definitely have some sort of transformative um, experience. They're like, they're like doubling its size right now. Yes. So it's close Cause they're, they're like, it's huge. I drive by it. I drive by it every day on my way home. Um, and I used to live around the corner from it. So like, it's been, I'm really excited for them to reopen, but It really has been, I've talked to so many artists in Pittsburgh that are not glass artists per se, but have all had different interactions or classes or moments that they've like gone there to explore something in their practice in a new material. Mm -hmm. And it's, I haven't seen anyone come out of there that's not been super excited by like the way that interacting with glass changed their perspective of like material or approach in their work. And like, That to me is something that's really, I mean, I think you can say that about any material, but I think there's something about it as like a, yeah, as a process, as like a, as a non-glass make, like a person not making in glass. I do think that like, there's something um, that feels, yeah, like you just are going into this like world in which like what you were describing Mm -hmm. earlier, that there's a, you know what's going on, but you don't always have full like control yeah. or mechanism. And that's like what we're all doing in our studios all the time. Um, and that's super exciting and kind of interesting to me. And I think also someone as like a, like that's like interested and curious in science. It's such a like 
scientific way of operating yes. and making and thinking mm-hmm. um, and a process that like relies on that. And that to me is the most exciting maybe aspect of it of like a, that as a possibility is really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm really excited to see what you do with glass because I just feel like the way you think and your perspective on things is like, it's like, it's not backwards, but it's like, Maybe like it's yeah. rotated yeah. in a way, you know, totally. and yeah. it's like yeah. kind of so, you know, and then there's like so many opportunities to think of glass in that way, too, especially like from the scientific um, angle. And then just like yeah. all of like glass is really for nerds. And I just like, I'm yeah. not calling you a nerd, but I'm calling you a nerd. And no, I feel like I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's just yeah. like the nerds shall like rule yeah. the world, like take over, yeah. you know? And so I just feel like it would like be perfect for you in so many ways, just like in terms of like scientific glass or like 3D printed glass or just thinking about or making things in a way that you wouldn't normally make them. And I mean, like that's what I love about glasses. Like I love nerding out on like kind of the scientific ways or just like so highly yeah. technical. Even if you'd make things that aren't like they don't look like it's like I made like, you know, a couple of things and like some ways they don't really look technical, but it's like, do you know what I had to do to get to this point? It was like Yeah. And just like even fabricating and flame working where it's like you think about how to make something I always like go over the steps and like kind of act them out. And then I'm like thinking about where to put this blow tube and then like changing my axis. And then um, like I was talking about like one of my friends, how I think it's just like ones and zeros and stuff that's in his Uh brain. Like I kind of Uh feel like that was your brain too. Uh But (laughs) like in my brain, I have like these like diagrams and then like, okay it's like okay I gotta turn it this way and then like rotate it that way and then like you have to like angle your flame here in order to make this like see like you know there's just all of these like different ways to do it and it's like okay if I keep this thing hot here then um you know like so like you can do so much and like I can just like see you working that way or like figuring out things that way and like the whole like nerd aspect of like working with glass is just so perfect for you. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I don't really like yeah, know you yeah. all that well, but I can I know, tell that you're a nerd and you're yeah. going to love it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think so too. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. I like drive by it every day and I'm like soon. Like, soon. I'm yeah. Y'all I know. Soon. Uh-huh. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. so excited. Like I, you know, I did this um, residency at Pittsburgh Glass Center and they're like, we're going to expand. And I was like, Oh my God, this is going to be unbelievable. Yeah. So I yeah. can't like, I really, I can't wait to go back and like see their expansion and like work yeah. there and yeah. be a part of it and everything and um yeah maybe like hopefully we'll be there at the same time so then we can oh, yeah. do nerd yeah. stuff together yeah for sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'll be here yeah, yeah. cool yeah. this has been another episode of the geeks talks q a podcast i'm emily leach i'm one part of the geeks team along with ben orosco and helen lee this episode followed kimberly thomas's and Britt ransom's respective geeks talks lectures in spring 2024. The Geeks crew received questions from our audience, whittled them down to a short list, and then shared them with the speakers as a framework for their discussion. We've included the full list of questions in the show notes, so check them out to see how your thoughts influenced the conversation. To learn more about these artists, follow Kimberly Thomas at IROCKZ, that's I-R-O-C-Z-I-I, and Brit Ransom at Brit Ransom underscore studio on Instagram. Many thanks to our sponsors for this episode, His Glassworks and Wet Dog Glass. His Glassworks manufactures and supplies quality cold working tools for the glass art industry. Based in Asheville, North Carolina, their team has well over three decades of cold working experience. His Glassworks understands that your work leaves but your tools live with you. To learn more, visit their website at hisglassworks.com. In business since 1996, Wet Dog Glass delivers unsurpassed value and turnkey hot glass studio equipment, studio planning and consultation, and technical support. Wet Dog Glass, your studio's best friend. Visit their website at wdg-us.com. 
If you haven't subscribed to Geeks Talks yet, there's a three month public access period. Visit the Geeks Glass YouTube channel to listen and enjoy these lectures before they enter the Geeks Talks archive. Learn more about subscribing to Geeks Talks on our website, geeks.glass support. For a limited time, the Geeks Shop is offering a graduation bundle for a year-long subscription to Geeks Talks and exclusive merch. That's over 30 hours of content on contemporary glass artists and researchers in addition to the upcoming season of Geeks Talks. If you're looking for a gift for someone graduating from a BFA or MFA program, this is a great way to help them stay connected to the glass community after academia. Available now through June 2024. Learn more at geeks.glass shop. For updates on Geeks, sign up for our newsletter. You can also follow us at Geeks Glass on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. If you enjoyed this episode, rate and review the Geeks Talks Q&A podcast on your preferred podcasting platform. The Geeks Talks Q&A podcast is produced by Emily Leach, that's me, and Ben Orozco. Our theme is Refraction by Poddington Bear, with some additional music by Otis McDonald. A huge thank you to the Geeks Talk subscribers for your continued support and engagement. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned.